It's very unfortunate, but we see many well-meaning, often very smart people get into the restaurant business and make many of the same mistakes. In this section, we're going to discuss some of the most common missteps and poor decisions that we see first-time restaurant owners making both before and then after their restaurant opens. If you decide to move forward and open your own restaurant, being aware of these common pitfalls should be extremely valuable as you make those crucially important planning and startup decisions that can literally make or break your restaurant. Avoid these common errors and you will dramatically improve your chances for success. We're going to discuss this topic within the framework of the three steps to restaurant success that we talked about in session four. So let me quickly review them. First of all, find out what they want. Remember, it's not about what you want to sell or what you're passionate about cooking. It's all about what do the people in your market want in terms of food, beverage, service, speed, price, and so on. Step two is go and get it. After listening to the market and identifying what they want, you have to create it. That means finding the right location and incorporating the design, ambience, equipment, menu, recipes, and skills needed to give your market what they want. And then step three, give it to them. Once the restaurant opens, you've got to be ready with a well-trained, capable staff to execute and deliver the high-quality guest experience that your customers want consistently every time. And you have to be able to do it in a profitable manner. And just to review further, the first two steps take place in the startup phase before the restaurant opens, and those decisions will determine whether you have a shot at having a good restaurant, which is providing the experience that appeals to a sufficient number of people in your local market. Step three, give it to them, begins on opening day when the focus shifts from startup activities to taking care of customers, ensuring quality and consistency, and managing the financial aspects of the restaurant. These activities will determine whether the restaurant becomes a good, that is profitable, business. So, here are some of the common mistakes we see connected with step one, finding out what they want. Number one is we see many independent owners starting restaurants without finding out what the people in their local market actually want to buy. In other words, instead of being market-driven and determining what type of concept or experience their restaurant should provide, they started out focused inward on the menu, the products that they preferred to sell, or the type of restaurant that they want to own and operate. So as a result, they begin the process of planning and developing the restaurant based on an idea, product, or experience that they are personally passionate about before identifying if it's something that people actually want. If you can't articulate who will want what your restaurant will offer and why they want it, you will have a serious problem. Now, do some folks get lucky? Yes, they do. But relying on luck is not a winning business strategy, especially when you're putting up tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars or more on the line. That is a recipe for disaster. Don't make the mistake of believing that just because you and possibly a few friends or family members think you have a brilliant idea for a restaurant, that anyone else in your town or area will think so too. You must find out what the people in your market want to buy. So how do you find out what they want to buy? You have to go out and talk to as many potential customers as you can and you ask them. You ask them what restaurants do you go to on a regular basis now and why? And what kind of dining experience would you like to have that currently isn't available? Ask them to be specific, what kind of food, location, service style, price points, etc. Would they be attracted to and how often they would go? Talk to people and then listen very closely to what they say. Talk to enough people and I promise you, you will end up accumulating lots of incredibly valuable information and you'll likely discover that what they want is quite different than what you initially thought. That is the first and the most important step in the process. Just because you build it does not mean that they will come unless you're able to give them what they want. So find out what they want. We also see many independent restaurants open with what we refer to as a weak concept. In other words, the restaurant has few, if any, meaningful distinctions or defining characteristics that set them apart from the competition or delivers a clear, compelling value proposition. A lack of distinction often means a restaurant either intentionally or by default is attempting to appeal to everyone. And when you try to appeal to everyone, very often you end up appealing to no one. 
One of the main reasons many first-time independents lack defining characteristics is they are focused almost exclusively on the food and the menu in describing their concept and restaurant. Sure, the food and menu is important, and in most restaurants, it will be the driving force of the concept. But never forget, a restaurant today is so much more than just the food. It's about the entire dining or guest experience. In addition to the food and menu, a restaurant's concept should encompass everything about the restaurant that touches the customer, physically, visually, and even emotionally. Let me explain. A concept description should include meaningful and unique characteristics in design, atmosphere, service, and even include values, culture, and other important aspects of your operation. This could mean distinctions in sourcing products, sustainable practices, support for certain causes. In other words, all the elements that define not only what's on the menu, but also who you are and the distinctive ways you intend to do business. Why is this important? Well, one reason is the largest living generation, millennials, those who were born between 1982 and 2004, tend to be particularly interested in the values and operating practices of the companies that they do business with. They're looking for more than just products and services. They want an emotional connection with the companies that they patronize. Millennials also spend more money dining out than non-millennials. If you're interested, here are a few newer, very popular restaurant brands we believe illustrate a well-thought-out, distinct, and multi-dimensional concept that appeals to or connects with consumers on several levels. Taking a look at their website should give you a sense of what's important to them and what's unique about their concept. You might even get some ideas for your own concept. So when you're talking to potential customers, be sure and listen for all the things that they would like to see embodied in a local restaurant not just about the food and the service style. Ask questions that drill down deeper to learn what types of values, business practices, and other characteristics that they look for in companies they frequent on a regular basis. Again, listen to your market. Let them tell you what they want and plan accordingly. Your odds of success will go up dramatically. Now, let's move to common mistakes in step two. Go and get it. Another area ripe for missteps, especially for first-time operators, has to do with finances, particularly the initial startup or capital investment of the restaurant. Often, with first-time owners in particular, the total startup cost in relation to the sales potential of the restaurant is often totally out of whack. While a deep discussion of what we refer to as the sales-to-investment ratio is beyond the scope of this program, let me say that in general, anticipated sales volume should be at least 1.2 to 1.5 times the total startup cost of opening a restaurant in a lease space. For example, if it's going to cost $500,000 to open a new restaurant, there should be a high level of expectation that the restaurant in this location will be capable of generating annual sales of at least $600,000 to $750,000. While there are many variables and additional factors to consider, the point we want to make here is that there's only so much of an investment that is prudent to invest in any single location. So this means that for every dollar of startup investment, there should be an expectation of generating at least $1.20 to $1.50 in sales for the project to make economic sense in a location that is leased. One thing you must do when considering any location is prepare a reasonable, conservative projection of sales volume based on an estimated check average and anticipated daily guest counts. This is a very, very important exercise to conduct in analyzing any site or location. Now, we provide more detail on this in our business plan resources. Also, cost overruns are common to first-time operators because there are always surprises and surprises always end up costing more money. This puts many new restaurants in a position of starting out in the hole and owing more money than they have and is why undercapitalization is such a big reason many restaurants go under shortly after opening or within their first year. They simply run out of cash before the restaurant has a chance to become profitable. We always recommend first-time operators add at least a 20% contingency to their startup budget for unforeseen startup expenditures and cost overruns. Also, since many first-timers are unfamiliar with construction details, construction contracts, and choosing and working with contractors, problems often arise that extend the construction period 
or cause the project to go over budget. Another big mistake is choosing or settling on a poor location. As you can imagine, selecting the wrong location can be devastating for a restaurant. Here are a few of the most common location mistakes. First, a restaurant opens in the wrong market. This can happen when little or nothing is done to identify one or more specific target markets or customers the restaurant will most likely appeal to, and then choose a location where large numbers of those consumers are located. For example, let's say you have a high-end trendy bistro concept that would appeal to young affluent professionals. This kind of concept should not go into a suburban shopping center surrounded by neighborhoods full of middle-class working families with kids. In all likelihood, there won't be a sufficient number of target customers to draw from in that kind of a local market. Now, let me also add, the local market that the vast majority of your customers will come from will likely be no more than about three to five miles from your restaurant. Now, if you're in more of a rural or small town type of area where people are accustomed to driving longer distances, it could be more. But my point here is do not get overconfident in thinking that lots of people are going to travel more than five miles to visit your restaurant. Chances are they won't, unless, unless you're able to create something really, really special. Next is poor access or visibility. Especially for a new concept, the location must be convenient and easy to access. Even though smartphone apps can help people find you online, there's still no substitute for a highly visible and appealing storefront and sign that lots of people see every day. Another common mistake is going into a location that's too expensive. A good rule of thumb is that occupancy costs should be no more than 10% of projected sales. Occupancy cost includes rent, property taxes, common area maintenance, and insurance on the building and contents. Let me give you an example. Assume that the annual occupancy cost of a 3,000 square foot space was as follows. You have annual fixed rent of $60,000, property taxes of $15,000, common area maintenance $3,000, and insurance on the building and contents of $12,000 for a total annual occupancy cost of $90,000. To consider this location, you would need to be very confident that your restaurant would generate sales of at least $900,000, and that would be an absolute minimum, and it would be preferred to anticipate annual sales of at least a million dollars or more with an occupancy cost of $90,000. Even if you have a stellar concept and lots of customers, if your rent is too high, it will seriously handicap your restaurant's potential for success. As you can see, the restaurant business is much more than just serving food and customers. It's also about numbers and making smart business decisions. Now let's move to step three, give it to them, and talk about some of the common mistakes that occur once the restaurant is open. Number one in the operating phase is a lack of systems. Systems in a restaurant includes checklists and forms and manuals and procedures and other tools to ensure that the restaurant is organized and operates in a consistent, pre-designed or determined way all day, every day. And the systems need to be in place and functioning on day one. So that means that the process of assembling and creating some level of operating systems should begin well before opening day and is actually a very important startup activity. In many new independent restaurants, there are no standard recipes or instructions on how to prepare every single item on the menu exactly the same way every time. This dramatically increases the likelihood that food quality will vary depending on who's working in the kitchen. A lack of effective hiring and training systems means poor hiring and training practices that result in bad hiring decisions, unproductive employees, high turnover, and other employee-related problems. A lack of systems also guarantees a high level of disorganization and even chaos in the fast-moving and often highly charged restaurant operating environment. All of these issues add up to the worst possible result, a poor, inconsistent guest experience. If a restaurant opens and there are no systems or instructions in place for the most basic tasks like cleaning the restrooms, marinating the chicken, setting up the server stations, or restocking the bar, it's very difficult I would say impossible to give customers what they want more than anything else, a consistent, high-quality guest experience. That's why it's so common for new restaurants to be very busy in the first few weeks after they open when everyone comes in and checks them out, but after having a bad or mediocre experience, many never return. Another big mistake is not starting with 
solid financial controls in place. When you work with cash, food, alcoholic beverages, and lots of employees, there are many, many ways to lose money. A lack of financial controls leads to excessive waste and spoilage and theft and high costs and expenses, particularly in the areas of food, beverage, labor, and supplies. And to top it off in many new restaurants, the bookkeeping and accounting is in disarray, so the owner has no idea what the restaurant's key costs and margins are running and if the restaurant is profitable or losing lots of money. Now, just a little aside note here. Accounting in a restaurant is unlike accounting in any other business. Please hear me and trust me on this. Do not open a restaurant without an experienced, competent restaurant accountant, CPA, or bookkeeper on your team, or advising you from day one. And finally, another problem that hurts new restaurants is once the restaurant opens, the owner becomes more of a command and control boss than an inspiring leader. The bossy, do this and don't do that management style of the past is not only ineffective, but is actually counterproductive when working with today's younger workers. Without exception, all of the highly successful independent owners that we work with today are good leaders. They set very high standards, but they are very conscious about creating a positive, productive workplace and recognizing their people for their contributions and hard work. They know that when their employees like their jobs and their coworkers, and they feel respected and appreciated by the owner and managers, they're much more inclined to do their best, work together as a team, and take great care of their guests. We refer to this as building a strong culture and is something that we devote a lot of resources to in the members area on RO.com. Being a fair, trustworthy, and supportive leader as opposed to an order barking boss makes a huge difference in the type of culture a restaurant will have and the level of success that it will achieve. While this is just a short summary of the common mistakes that new restaurant owners make, we hope that it will provide some insights into the types of decisions and preparations that need to be made months before a restaurant's opening day. I believe it was legendary Chicago restaurateur Rich Melman who said, 80% of a restaurant's success is determined before it opens. This is so true. The seeds of a successful restaurant are planted in the early planning stages, so the more aware you are of potential problem areas and are able to avoid them, the better. So many people open restaurants and get blindsided by things that they never saw coming, and that just compounds the effects of the problem. As they say, being forewarned gives you the advantage of being forearmed. Good luck, and thanks for watching.